Welcome back, welcome back. This week, Pope Benedict XVI is here in the UK on an official state visit, the first ever such visit by a pope to these shores. It comes at a hugely turbulent time for the Catholic Church. Not only has it been rocked by the global sex abuse scandals, it's also been accused by some in the Anglican Church here in Britain of trying to poach disaffected members. As an example, cynics point to the Pope's decision to celebrate, while he's here, the life of the 19th century Cardinal Newman, who himself crossed from the Anglicans to the Catholic Church. What a coincidence. Before the Pope landed, just before he landed, in fact, I spoke to the man who's organising the whole trip, the head of the Catholic Church in England and Wales, Archbishop Vincent Nichols. Your Grace, a very, a very warm welcome. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the, the Pope's visit, um, people have been analysing the press coverage and so on in advance of the arrival of the Pope, have said that 90%, 80% of it had seemed on balance negative, in fact. Would you say, if there's any truth in that, would you say that that is because of a British uh, godlessness or, in fact, more to do with the child abuse scandal? I think it's a puzzlement first because we're in a society that doesn't have clear bearings when it comes to religious belief. I think, in fact, the very basic message that Pope Benedict will bring, I believe, will be to invite us to look at faith in God not so much as a problem to be solved, but as a gift to be rediscovered. And I think in this country, for all sorts of reasons, faith is considered as a problem. And therefore, somebody who represents and stands for one of the world's major faiths is a, is a slightly problematic figure to begin with. And the fact for some people in this country that this is a state visit also raises questions. Why oh, yes. is a religious leader coming here on a Why state visit? Why is it visit? a state? It hasn't yeah. got any population yeah. and yeah, so on. That's right, that's yeah. right. So th there's a combination of things, and including, and this is important certainly in the media, the undoubted question marks and, and real challenge that is posed to the Catholic Church, to me and to every Catholic, that some priests have seriously committed grave offences against children, which is a terrible, terrible thing. First of all, for those who've been abused and also for, for the church. But we're facing that and we, we work you, on how, that. Yes, it's, it's, it's a huge problem, but you, you read through and, and uh, you see the things about re repeated cover-ups and so on. I'm just looking at quotes here surrounding priests who've abused children, allegations of abuse not reported by the church, and your own, your own saying that in fact people's, people, some Catholics seem to think it was more important to suppress the news than, than get the message out to the police and so on. How do you fight that? How do you improve well, that? I think in, in this country, in England, we have worked very hard over the last 10 years and we've had two independent inquiries into how we handle these things, both led by peers, experienced people of uh, public administration, and they've helped us to put in place proper procedures. Now, I think the fact is that child abuse is the most hidden crime of all. And victims, first of all, find it very difficult to get themselves believed. And this is not simply in the context of the Catholic Church, wherever. And so it's a real opening up of, of an area of betrayal that initially nobody wants to face. And that's the painful path that we've been walking. And I think honestly, and I think with integrity, and there is no holding back now, there is no cover up now, and, and I think, to be quite honest with you, some bishops who were faced with this, these allegations really found it very hard to believe. Sometimes as parents, when children come to them, or grown-up children, and say, I was abused in my youth, find it hard to believe. Now, that's not an excuse. We should have done better. And now I think we've learned an awful lot about this. And there is no cover-up now. And in this country, where we have excellent relationships with public authorities, the social services, the police, we work together with them. Not simply in the supervision of allegations, not simply in the work of safeguarding, but we also work with them in how do we best make sure that offenders who are released from prison are kept in a covenant of care and are kept safe. We work with the police and the social services positively in that way as well.
And so, that, uh, as you just say, that although it was a huge problem, that you think you've vanquished the cover-up mentality. Yes, I do. I think we've got over the cover-up mentality. We, the business of pr creating a, a context in which everybody is safe is a constant daily effort. And the kind of checks and the self-awareness that we need needs to become as instinctive as cleaning your teeth in the morning. Because if you don't do those things, your teeth begin to rot. Right. And it's, it, it's a, constant, yes. a constant habit of mind now that we're alert. And so uh, if a bishop uh, today or next week or whatever discovers a case of child abuse involving a priest and so on, who does he, who does he speak to first? To, to you or to his immediate superior uh, or to the police? Well, do you know, in, quite honestly, in my experience, I'm not the first one to find out. What normally it comes to me from a route already that, that the person who's making this declaration or making this allegation, they don't normally come to the bishop first. They come to somebody who's closer to them. And in every parish in this country, we have a child protection officer, a safeguarding officer. Sometimes they're the first ones to be approached. What we would do is then I would get in touch with the officer in this diocese and he would liaise immediately with the police. And then it would be handled primarily by the police. They would inquire into the allegation and we would take it step by step from there. We've been talking about a problem that is an international problem, actually, haven't we? They talk oh. about South America, North America, Europe, and so well, on. This uh, is a world problem for the Catholic Church. Well, uh, if you don't mind me saying so, it, it's a world problem, full stop. Um, the Catholic Church has its part in that problem, but in fact, it's a minor part. And the, the, the abuse of children that goes on, say in this country, it's minor part in the Catholic Church. That's not an excuse. We will tackle ours. We really, we are doing so. And I think there's a lot for society to, to learn right around the world about how badly treated children can be. All over, all over the world. Yeah. Um, you are beatifying Cardinal Newman while the Pope is here, or the Pope is doing so. Uh, some people say, hey, that's a bit of uh, cunning Catholic uh, soul poaching. Um, is it? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Don't forget, Cardinal Newman was for more than 30 years a parish priest in Birmingham in a Catholic parish. So I think what the church is doing is recognizing qualities in John Henry Newman's life that are outstanding. That includes his life as an Anglican. We're not kind of saying, oh, he was bad until we he crossed that line. We don't know what happened line. to him until no, this no, age. No. No. Everything about Newman's life is, is looked at and tested. And what we find is here is a man who from the age of 15 understood that the central dynamic of his life was how he, with his self, sense of self and God present to him, worked out that journey through life. So he was a man who lived in the presence of God. And that's the basis of his holiness, not whether he was an Anglican or a Catholic. Last week I, I discussed this topic with Tony Blair in a special, special we did last week, that suddenly um, Stephen Hawking had come out and, and said that uh, God wasn't needed anymore. We, God was not needed to have created the world anymore. We don't need that hypothesis anymore so we can forget that. Does that shake anybody's faith, do you think? Well, I think the response to Stephen Hawkins' comments from the point of view of a physicist showed beyond any doubt that there's no indifference to religion in this country. It provoked a great debate. And, and I think that's right and proper. One of the really interesting things is what's the difference between science and religion? What's the relationship between faith and reason? Pope John Paul II said, I think very beautifully, that faith and reason are the two wings on which the human spirit soars. And we need both. We need faith and reason. If you separate reason from faith, then it doesn't have the uplift. If you separate faith from reason, then it can indeed go to extremes which are unhealthy. But it is very much a Catholic vision that faith and reason, right from Aristotle's inheritance through the Middle Ages, faith and reason belong together. And my faith is something that does not offend against my reasoning. In fact, the two serve each other. 
And what do you think is the greatest problem that people today have with their faith? I mean, what's the most difficult thing? Obviously, for people who are involved or know about the child abuse thing, that's obviously very, very important. But, and then Stephen Hawking says God didn't create the world. What, what's the greatest problem you encounter when you're trying to persuade people? Well, if I could, a dog, yeah. he'll help them. If I could go back to Cardinal Newman. Cardinal Newman had two outstanding principles. One, he said, we grow in faith and in our life of faith in the context of relationships. And secondly, he said, it's a matter of the heart, of the imagination. He was a great believer in the power of the, the kind of the mind to take a leap and to s imagine things differently. And I think partly we've lost that courage of imagination, the kind of pragmatism, the positivism of the age that says everything must be measured and demonstrated. Kind of it's a very reduced sense of human reasoning. Human reasoning with imagination can say, you know, my life can be different. I can achieve great things. And when we begin to sense and allow space for God to work in our lives, then that can happen. Your Grace, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, David. Thank you. Well, that's, that's all we have time for this week. You can follow the Pope's tour through till Sunday right here on Al Jazeera English, of course. My thanks, though, right now to all our guests today. And as the Archbishop was doubtless saying, God bless you all. Thank you.